This week on Cougar Creations. This week we did a deep dive into some of our favorite teacher summers and found out what they did and why they did it. Then we went to Weston Elementary School to talk to their teacher of the year. Interested in finding out what we do next week? Follow along on our Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube to stay up to date on all things Cougar Creations and GCHS Radio TV. And welcome back to Cougar Creations. I'm Josie. And I'm Tyler. And we are so stoked to be back to school after our awesome summer break. That is so right. And speaking of, have you ever wondered what teachers do over the summer? I sure have. Well, same here. In fact, I was so curious that I actually contacted a few of our teachers and found out what they did over summer. Today, we're going to be talking with our very own Mr. Hudson and some other staff members to see what they did over summer break. Yep. And then we are going to be doing a throwback with Weston's Teacher of the Year interview. But for now, let's send it over to Josie and Mr. Hudson. Many teachers, just like students, look forward to summer. While time away from the classroom is always wanted and needed, you might be surprised to know that teachers don't just sit around all summer. Whether it be getting a new certification or getting professional real-life experience, teachers are out and about during a short but productive summer. <laughs> Mr. Hudson is the head of our radio TV department. He's heading into his 11th year of teaching. Mr. Hudson worked on numerous shoots and projects, working with a production company as an assistant director, along with various freelance projects. He's worked to learn a lot of new equipment and techniques that he's hoping to integrate into our program. Today we're here to talk to him some more about his busy summer and about the importance of staying up to date in a tech-driven industry. Hi there, I'm Josie Joyner and I'm joined today with my teacher, Mr. Hudson. How are you doing today? I'm great, how are you? I'm good. So I heard that you spent some time over the summer working on various projects. What was it like to kind of step away from the classroom and step back into a more professional environment? Uh, it's, it's good and bad because you want to, I feel like if I just spend the entire summer not doing anything, then I feel like I come back to school and I'm a little fuzzy and I have to get my own skills back. Mm -hmm. I feel like I came back into this school year just ready to go, you know. But I did take enough time to rest and spend time with family, but it was a lot of fun producing projects, so it's different. I mean, I think I come back into the classroom when I have a busy summer with really high expectations. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the first couple of days I, I gave my speech and all that, and, you know, it's I always write down these ideas that I have, so I, we, we're off to a really good start. So a lot of it is the balance of making time for yourself, and I spend a lot of time riding my bike and traveling but then also incorporating video pieces into that as well. Cool. So is it difficult to transition from working in the classroom and teaching students and then going back into like the professional setting and doing shoots? Uh, to an extent, yeah, it's a little mm -hmm. difficult because when you show up on a professional shoot with what I do with Precise Take, I'm just with people that just do it all the time. So there's not really a teaching element. We just kind of react. We go and we just do it. Whereas when I'm teaching, there's a little more patience. There's a little more... Uh, it's kind of more like chess. You're moving pieces right. around. You're trying to put kids in good positions. Whereas on a professional project, when you're working with people at that kind of level, everyone's pretty much skilled. So you don't necessarily have to do as much of that. You're kind of more just on like quality control. So like as a director, I had like a young guy that was really good at drones. So it was just sort of, I wasn't educating him because he's skilled, but mm -hmm. you kind of say, hey, this is what we need. This is how I think you should film it. And then I worked with a young videographer and then we had Ashley, of course, mm -hmm. helping me. So it was kind of like, you know, more or less saying this is what we need. But I expected her to be able to to do that, you know, on right. her own besides being in a classroom where I would kind of teach her a little more, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. 
So what do you think the importance of working on professional shoots and staying up to date is in such a tech-driven industry? Well, it's important because there's this new equipment. You know, mm -hmm. we, we got a new drone. I spent a lot of time working with that drone, learning pretty much everything about it, mastering the settings, making sure that when you guys use it, it'll be easy to use. And there's just a lot of thought that goes into that. So I do spend a lot of time on professional projects, but I'm always thinking about what are the best ways that we can do things in the classroom. And that's why when you look at Cougar Creations and you look at our projects, they look pretty good because I'm just stealing kind of the technology and the ideas from my professional work and bringing them in here because I think you guys are quite capable of recreating it with good instruction. So, um, What do you find to be the most rewarding part of doing videography with Precise Take in general? Oh, it's just fun. I mean, Aaron and I go back. You know, he was the uh, piano player at my dad's church and I was the bass player, so we've always had a really good connection. We work well together. We, we have high expectations. We kind of see things the same way. And when you're in a close partnership with someone, especially with video, it's important because mm -hmm. I've seen friends work together on projects and have had falling outs and you know people want to do things a certain way. So for me, I respect like that is his full-time job. That is his company. Now that I'm back in school, I just kind of help more when I can. And that's just kind of part of it. So you know, when it comes to the projects that he chooses and the clients, and he's the one that's out there hustling and doing all the sales. I really just want to support him and, and be a good teammate to him and a, and a good partner. All right. So what kinds of equipment do you get to work with on these shoots? Are they different than what we use in the classroom? Or? They're a lot more expensive. <laughs> uh, we use a, uh, his main camera is kind of a Sony FS5. The body alone on that camera is probably about $6,000. He has at least four lenses that work with it. One of the lenses is actually used in a lot of films. It's used on a lot of TV shows. It's a long lens, so it has a lot of different controls on the lens. So it's a really, really nice setup. Um, lighting equipment is mostly the same that we would have here. And then his DSLR is the Sony a7 III, mm. so it's a little bit nicer than our Canons that we have. Uh, but they all do the same thing. You still have to shoot manual. You have to know, like when we were setting this up, how to adjust the exposure. So it's still the same techniques. It's just slightly maybe nicer equipment than what we would have. Okay, cool. So what kind of skills or techniques have you learned on shoots that you'd like to bring into the classroom that you haven't already? Uh, I think I spent a lot more time shooting things documentary style mm -hmm. this summer. So really paying attention to getting quality B-roll. And you saw that last year when we did the Peace Walk final. Mm -hmm. I gave you guys a lot of really good B-roll to pick from. So you always practice B-roll techniques with the Osmo, with a DSLR, how to get creative shots so it's not just the same kind of shots. You need, you know, I, I have a better understanding of how B-roll helps tell your story. So that's why I'm always a stickler on when the B-roll isn't very good. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's a big thing. And then just always finding ways to get better audio in the field is just challenging, mm -hmm. you know, with the wind and the conditions, and then you deal with all kinds of different people. So I think all those things just come down to really paying attention, knowing your equipment, and then being prepared. Very interesting. So you mentioned earlier that you did a lot of stuff over the summer other than working in the professional field. So what else did you get up to this summer? Oh, I got to travel. So I took a bike trip. Um, that's when you basically just ride your bike and then you stay in a hotel and you wake up and you ride, you stay in a hotel. And I actually took the drone mm. and a GoPro and an Osmo. So I just finished as of last night cutting a 15 minute little documentary about that. And that was really good practice to use mm -hmm. all that equipment. So I did that. Uh, I went to Denver and filmed a lot of stuff in Colorado in the mountains. So I, I cut a little Instagram edit for that. Um, made some promotional stuff for the cycling team. So just small stuff here and there. Very cool. So whenever we get something here at school, the first thing I do is I take it home mm -hmm. and I just learn how to use it. Very nice. So we've heard a lot about your DJing just in class. How would you say your skills have improved over the summer compared to like where you started at the beginning? Uh, just a lot more comfortable. Mm -hmm. You know, DJing is confidence. It's what I try to teach you guys. It, it just relates to being in front of people, relates to being in front of a camera. You just have to be very confident. You have to be very organized. So I think the DJing side as a teacher helps me be a little more organized. It helps me be focused, but then understanding like things come up, like we have another interview to shoot after this that, you know, and that we just have to kind of sneak in. So mm -hmm. you're organized, but you're able to adapt. And that's what really being a good DJ is. 
Awesome. Well, that's all I've got for you today, so thanks for talking to me. Thanks. Ms. Grimes is one of the Spanish teachers here at GC. Today, we're here to talk to her about her time spent in Costa Rica. We're going to find out about what she did on the trip and the logistics of planning a trip like this. Our school takes a lot of trips around the world. It's been said to be an amazing experience for everyone who goes. In fact, we've done a show about a European trip during season three. While this isn't the first trip Miss Grimes has been a chaperone on, this is the first one where she was the main coordinator. Let's find out some more about her summer. So I heard that you went to Costa Rica this summer. What was one of your favorite activities that you did? Um, for me, I think my favorite activity was whitewater rafting. Um, have you taken any trips to other countries before this, either like with this specific tour company or just like on your own? Yeah, I went on a trip that Miss Sears led last fall to Europe. Um, and then I've also been on several other trips, not like student trips with as myself and in college. So how is the culture in Costa Rica different from what you've experienced in the US or in other Spanish speaking countries? Um, Costa Rican people are very like laid back and like very friendly. Like we would joke that they're like the Midwest of Central America because all of the people were just so welcoming and very like hospitable. So what makes you want to take students on trips like these? Um, being able to share like things that I know are really cool and they don't necessarily feel that like in the classroom and being able to actually see it um, applied in real life is a really neat opportunity. So I know that like graduated seniors were able to go on this trip. So what was it like seeing students you formerly had in class in a more relaxed setting? It was definitely different. There were still a good amount of kids that I had never had in class. So, but being able to be in that more like relaxed environment was really cool to see the kids kind of more outside of the classroom. So in both this trip and the fall trip you mentioned, what responsibilities do you have as a chaperone that you might not have originally expected? Um, well, on the fall trip, because I was like a chaperone and not the group leader, I didn't have a ton of extra responsibilities. But on this one, because on Costa Rica, I was the group leader. So I had to make a lot of like decisions as to what we were going to do, like spend our time. I had to coordinate a lot with our um, group leader, or what's it called, a tour guide. Um, our, we had a guide that was with us the whole time. So I had to do a lot of that kind of stuff behind the scenes and stuff. So how can you teach students about the location while also providing them a good time? Like how do you balance the educational aspect with the sightseeing? Um, I think, well, our guide did a lot of the teaching when we were there um, because he's familiar with all the area. And so we would go do something fun and we'd stop in the middle and he would point out something really cool that we were like in the middle of and stuff. Hmm. Um, how did the, these trips impact your teaching style? Um, they definitely give me more like hands-on information that I can share with my students, even the ones who don't go, to teach them about like the culture and stuff of these places. How accessible are these trips for students? They're fairly accessible. They We plan them up to two years in advance and they can pay like every month. So um, really anyone can do it as long as you're saving up for it. So how can students find out more information about these types of trips? We send out emails and parent squares and Google Classroom posts. Ms. Amador is planning a trip, so I've been trying to, I sent out a parent square about her trip, and I don't know what Mr. Lesman does for his trips, but. All right, that's all I got for you. Okay, course. thanks. Mr. Bruck is one of the assistant principals at our school. While I'm sure he had a very busy summer, I joined him to talk about the work ethic certificate. This program is something that not many seniors know about or utilize, and that's why I was invited to speak with him about it. So let's learn some more about the governor's work ethic certificate. Hi there, my name's Josie Joyner, and I'm joined today with our vice principal, Mr. Brooke. How are you doing this morning? I'm great, Josie. All right, um, so I'm here to talk about the work ethic certificate. So why don't you tell me a little bit more about that? So the Work Ethic Certificate is a program sponsored by the Governor of Indiana and the Department of Workforce Development. And it's a program for seniors in high school who are looking to show that they have those soft skills needed to enter the workplace. And so they demonstrate those skills and then um, basically the school signs off and the governor says, yeah, you, you've got soft skills needed to be employable in Indiana. All right. So what's required for it? So the state sets nine criteria for us. Um, five of them are what we would say are soft skills. And so it includes, um, I'm gonna say perseverance is one of them, um, the ability to communicate well, being a self-starter, 
um, being reliable, and then kind of like an organization piece. And so we, we put your name into a database, basically, and you demonstrate those skills as a senior, and then a teacher goes in and signs off on you. And if three teachers sign off on all five categories or 15 teachers sign off so that you have three signatures for each of the five categories, you meet those five. And so that's kind of the soft skill side. And then the other side, we just kind of track through PowerSchool, and that is you have to have an attendance rate of 98%. And that's the hardest one for students because that's a really high attendance rate, but that's what the state says they're looking for. And so um, no A's, AU's, AUV's, or truancies, um, that counts against you. Um, you have to have a cumulative GPA for your whole high school career of 2.0. Um, you can't have any um, more than one discipline incident in your senior year, and you need to do six hours of community service. And so if you can do all nine things, um, you qualify. The one thing I think that's important to realize is that we don't look back, other than the GPA, we don't look back at your previous three years. So this is specifically for you and how you achieve in your senior year. And if you can demonstrate those things and do those things in your senior year, you're good to go. All right. So how can students sign up for it? The easiest thing to do is get on your senior Google Classroom that's through counseling, and there's going to be a Google form that's going to say work ethics certificate participation form. Um, click the link, fill out a couple of questions. It's basically contact info and then just reading the requirements and making sure you know what they are. And fill that out and submit that, and you will be all set. So. If you could do that by, we're going to say Labor Day, that would be great. That's how we'll get you in. All right. So what are some common questions that students normally have? Um, the it? attendance is always a big question, mm -hmm. like, hey, what counts? And so, yeah, just to be sure that you know that it counts the excused and the unexcused absences against you. So the state set that bar really high. Um, people always want to know about the community service, what, mm -hmm. what counts as six hours. That's probably easier just to ask me probably in person if you're questioning it. Um, but basically, we don't want you to double dip and use six hours for NHS and then also count them for this. Mm -hmm. So six unique hours. Um, and then the other thing is about the signatures. Um, do you need to go around as a student and, and beg for signatures from teachers and be like, oh, can you sign? <laughs> no, we don't want that because we don't want teachers to feel like guilty about mm -hmm. signing or not signing. So we just do that in an anonymous form that they have access to. Your job as a student is just to demonstrate the skills and, and my job as the facilitator of the program is to make sure teachers know that you're participating and to look for those skills in you and sign off saying, yeah, this student has those soft skills that we want. All right. Um, so where can students find out more about work ethic in general? There's a website. If you just search Governor's Work Ethic in Indiana, you can see the state's website. Um, there's actually some stuff where Greenfield's kind of featured because um, we've been doing the program for a long time. Mm -hmm then um, if you have specific questions about the program, you're going to want to stop by and see me or email me. That's the easiest way to do it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Summer is a time of relaxation for some, a time of travel for others, and a time of work for many. We wanted to take a look at what summer means to some of the staff at Greenfield. So why is summer special to you? So summer is special to me because I've got two boys at home that are growing up quickly and so they are 9 and 12 now and so summer is when we get to hang out and everything kind of slows down a little bit and we get to ride our bikes and play basketball and play tennis and all that good stuff so summer is important to me to have that time with them where I'm not as busy. Summer is important to me specifically because that is a time where I have off of work but also my kids do as well so it's not just the bustle of the everyday week. It is quality time with my kids, for the most part. Um, summer is important to me because it's a time when I don't have to worry about what I'm going to do every day. And I also get to see um, friends and family and like travel again, get to see them. Because um, that's something I did this summer that was really fun for me. I hadn't seen some friends in years. Um, and that's why I love summer, because that's a time when everyone's available to do that. I think summer is important just to kind of like get a little decompression from the everyday kind of work activities you might have to do. Um, it really gives you a chance to rekindle with friends, family, um, even prepare for the next year. So look back on, you know, what you did well, what you didn't do well, um, and really just go out and have the most fun you can as well. So for me, big golf guy, so I'm hitting the links in the summer. 
Um, but that's about it. It allows me a chance to wind down from all the chaos and the having to interact with people all day because as an introvert, I need some quiet time and time away from people. Thank you to our lovely staff members for taking time to sit down and talk to us about their summers. Now let's send it over to a newly edited Teacher of the Year interview at Weston Elementary School. Ms. Breidenthal is a wonderful candidate for Teacher of the Year. She just embodies what teaching is. She advocates for her children every day. She lesson plans so that it is engaging and exciting and she instills that love of wanting to come to school and the kids wanting to learn each and every day that they're here with us. She embraces the mission and lives the mission out daily. She is not only teaching her children to be good students but also to be great citizens of the community and the world. She's always looking for opportunities to extend their thinking outside of the walls at Weston so that they do become the young adults that we hope they can be. Well, Mrs. Breinthal is a great example um, for her colleagues. She is actually the leader of her team for PLCs and she is always digging the data to the fullest. She is very detail oriented. So a lot of times her colleagues might come to her with a big idea and then Mrs. Breinthal is very good about thinking about all the extra little details to make sure that we're making the impact on our students learning that we need to. She goes above and beyond because she's always willing to participate in extracurricular activities. She helps with fundraisers here at Weston. She's also out in the community often supporting her students and she just embodies um, what we hope every teacher will be at school, um, both inside and outside the walls. She makes a large impact on her students, not only the students that she currently has, but she does connect. She always is saying good morning and checking on kids, kindergarten through third grade. The students love being in her classroom and in her presence, and they always make the effort to come back to the classroom in the mornings to give her a hug, even when they've moved on to third grade. The mission statement is learning for all and all for learning, and the way that I think of that in my classroom is that all kids are different, um, but they all have a place in my room, and I just have to modify my teaching to meet their needs. And I do have high expectations for all of them to learn. But in my classroom, I take kids beyond their comfort zone by showing them that it's safe to make mistakes and teaching them to persevere and then move them into growing. So um, I teach them never to give up. Um, there's examples of that, like I meet with them individually to go through their reading and writing to set individual goals and push kids to move beyond um, what they initially expect. I teach kids to continue learning by, I think, instilling a love of learning and instilling a love particularly of reading so that outside of the classroom they will continue to read for enjoyment. Um, I partner with their parents to help collaborate with them so that they can set goals for learning at home as well. And um, we also do a lot of STEM projects. Um, I used to be a science teacher, so that's kind of a love of mine. And so we do a lot of STEM projects and I try to teach the kids that they can be scientists outside of the classroom and to explore the world. I think intentional learning in the classroom starts with me being an intentional teacher. Um, I intentionally plan. Um, I intentionally think of all the aspects of my students. And so I set really high standards for myself um, for, and set high expectations for myself. So in the classroom, I expect kids to also rise to those expectations and you know I intentionally plan but then I teach the kids to also be flexible and revise those things as we need to. So there's a lot of important issues. Um, I think one of the most concerning to me is that there are a lot of great teachers who are leaving teaching right now and that teacher burnout is created by putting a lot of things on their plate and not always having the support that they need um, from the communities, from government, um, and so on. Um, and that burnout leads to 
teacher shortages, which only makes it worse for the teachers who are there. So um, personally, I feel like I have a lot of support and support in this community, but I do think that it is a big issue nationwide. Being a leader means that you're positive and that you set a good example, um, that you lead by example. I find it really um, important for myself to help others. I enjoy helping others, and that means helping my colleagues, sharing ideas, and in that way, I can be a leader. Um, I love um, talking about the people who helped influence me because, first of all, I'd have to say my parents. My parents were both educators. Um, they both have now retired, but they taught for many, many years, one at Maxwell and one at Mount Comfort Elementary, and they really instilled in me a love of teaching and a, just, I was brought up in a culture of learning and teaching. And then I'd also say that phenomenal um, teammates that I have had, that I've taught with through the years, have helped push me to be better, um, and they've helped me to become a better teacher. Well, she's nice, and everybody here has fun, and she makes learning super fun. She is nice, and she helps you learn, and when you and she helps teach us that it's okay to make mistakes. We can always try again. She's nice and she uh, does a lot of good um, She's really nice and she um, makes learning really fun. The best part is that she makes sure everybody is kind and she's just real nice. She's such a good teacher because she lets us read, she helps us with our tests a little, and she's just very nice. Thanks to all of our guests for taking time out of their day to chat with us. And thank you to you, the viewer, for watching our show. Until next time, I'm Tyler. And I'm Josie, and I hope you have a cougar-tastic rest of your day. Interested in finding out what we do next week? Follow along on our Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube to stay up to date on all things Cougar Creations and GCHS Radio TV.